Welcome to Pookie Ponders, the podcast where I explore big questions with brilliant people. I'm Pookie Knightsmith and I'm your host. Today's question is, how does losing your sight affect how you feel? And I'm in conversation with Kate Holden. Kate is a Senko who works across her local authority, where she has set up nurture bases, worked across specialist provisions, pupil referral units and speech and language bases. She lost her sight for several years in her 20s due to a condition called keratoconus. In this episode, we're going to explore the wider impact on Kate of going from sighted to blind to sighted again, and how this informs her support for children. Hi, I'm um, Kate Holden, and I'm a specialist teacher working for a charity called the Together Trust. Um, So the majority of my work focuses on autism consultancy training and direct work with pupils. And that's not why I'm here today. I'm here in a non-work relating capacity um, to talk about my experiences of sight loss, um, which was about 15 years ago now. So in my late teens, I was diagnosed with um, a progressive eye condition called keratoconus, relatively rare, um, and it affects the cornea. And what happens is the cornea gradually becomes thin over time and bulges. Um, and becomes cone shaped. So this distorts vision quite significantly. Um, So late 20s, I was one of the really unlucky ones really as the disease had progressed so much so um, that there was nothing that could be done anymore. Um, So I had to have two corneal transplants, uh, two different donors, two years apart. Wow, and just, you you said it's quite an unusual condition and then even within the condition that you were a a kind of, sort of unlucky I guess in its its presentation it was it was especially severe did that I mean we, how did you were you angry um upset more than anything I just I was very very young you see and normally they'll want to save a cornea transplant till as late as possible because they predict that they'll only last about 20 years so they don't really want you having to go through that more than once mm. in a lifetime um so it was more of a I think I think I think I was a bit like a wounded animal, you know. Why me? Why has that happened to me? Why did that have to happen? Um, I, I was more. It was more that reaction, really, and it was also a bit unexpected because I'd gone on for so long wearing a particular type of contact lens called a scleral lens. Um, if you saw it, you'd be horrified. But it's about the size of a ten p coin, and um, and it and it literally pushes your cornea into the correct shape, so you can see. But the problem with those was. Um, they cut oxygen off to your eyes, your eyes become really sore and you can only wear them for about eight, eight hours or so. So it was getting to the point where my quality of life was awful because I was going to school and teaching, taking them out at lunchtime, putting them back in, coming home and at four o'clock they were out and then I couldn't see them for the rest of the evening. Um, and I didn't really think about that at the time, I just thought this is how it's going. And um, so it, it did become, it, it was quite a shock when they actually said, you know, uh, we're going to have to do something about it. And um, you wrote a beautiful uh, blog post about this experience, um, which was kind of what triggered us having this conversation. Because, yeah, I was I was really fascinated to to hear what it must be like, um, kind of, yeah, losing your sight, kind of going through that, and then and then sort of becoming sighted again. And I was yeah very intrigued by that. Um, and yeah, I'm going to read bits from your blog post and ask you to talk a little bit more about it, if that's okay. And I get th- this is quite hard you said you haven't really revisited this for quite a long time until you wrote the blog no no I mean I could honestly hand on heart say until I wrote that blog post there's only two times in a year when I will think about it and it's on the days that the operations happened and part of that is just you know reminiscing but part of that is because I know that there's two people out there you know who died and gave me their corneas and I just feel like I owe it to them to kind of remember that day. So there's only those two days I ever think about it. So when the opportunity came up for the blog, um, I just thought, yeah, let's go for it. And what I didn't realise at the time was how much I'd been holding onto all of those things that had happened. Because when, when you go through a traumatic experience, you just have to get through it. There's just no other way. And in some ways... You're a bit in like survival mode. You're not thinking about it at the time. You're just thinking, I've got to survive and get through this. So it was only when I started to write it down, I got really, really upset. And when I finished it, I did, I did sob a lot. Um, 
but it also felt really good to have got it out there. It's, it's interesting hearing you talk about it and how you were just kind of getting through it and it's only now that you almost understand the gravity of, of what you were, you were going through. Just, I have this conversation with you in the context of having just yesterday recorded an interview with my very close friend Jo where we explored um, a time in my life when I was actively suicidal and it, you know, it was a really hard time. And um, it, it's, it's interesting hearing you talk about it because actually that conversation with him was probably the first time I've really unpacked that time. And again, just stopped and gone, wow, that was really hard. And somehow you're just working on through. And I get it's a completely different situation, but I think some of those feelings are a little bit the, the, the same maybe, if you just yeah. can imagine. So at the beginning of your blog post, you talked about um, how you found out um, and and what kind of happened next and um, we you, you kind of quoted here you said um, you were told we cannot keep treating this condition Kate it's the end of the road and we're going to have to consider transplants now these were the exact words of my opt optometry consultant 15 years ago when I was 26 years old he then came over and gave me the biggest hug while I broke down in tears maybe not so professional of him but very human and that's exactly what I needed right there right then it had hit me like a ton of bricks and like oh, i just I, I got that far and i was i was in pieces i don't know how you must have felt writing it but i think talk to me about that you know that connection you had with that consult i mean that's horrible news to have to deliver for him and horrible news for you to have to hear and the fact that he did that in a human way i think is very important though no? it is it really is important and you know, I've known him for a long time. Um, I was diagnosed when I was at university in Manchester. So Manchester Royal Eye, Eye Hospital was literally over the road from my university. And even when I moved back home to Liverpool, I still kept going there. Um, I just felt like they, they knew me and I wanted to, to keep that continuity. So I did know him quite well. And by that point, um, you know, I'd been under him for about nine years. Wow. Um, and I could see, I just knew, you know, when he, when he looked at my eyes that time and he just went really quiet and he was really hesitant when he spoke and I just knew something bad was coming. Um, and I think this is why I think when I was teaching, there's always this thing, isn't there, about keeping that professional boundary. And it's so difficult sometimes because sometimes all people need is a hug mm -hmm. and they just need a bit of, of humanity, don't they? So I'm, I'm, I'm just so pleased that he did do that and that's what I needed at that moment and then I was kind of you know once we'd had that talk and and the other thing was he let me cry he just let me sit there and cry until I I, I was done um and I think it's really difficult isn't it when 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 you've you know bulge your eyes out and your face is bright red and you're sniffling and you don't want to walk out that room into a room full of people who you know are just going to stare at you straight away and you know, experiences like that make me do my job better. You know, I, I spend these one-to-ones with children sometimes, and then I know I have to send them back into a classroom. Um, and having gone through something like that, I never do that. I make sure if they need five minutes on their own, they get those five minutes on their own. Sometimes that's with me in the room. Sometimes it's with me gone, just so that they can get themselves together. And then you know, following that, I was quite quite quickly whisked away because um, they have a site site counsellor on site at the hospital. So anyone who's been given some news like that goes straight away um, to the counsellor who kind of sits you down and points you in the direction of some help, really. And was that, you know, that, that so that you had the two elements of that approach then, one, the very um, human and then the, the very practical. And, and I guess both of those things were important. Yeah, yeah. I think I think really the hug was the most important. I don't think I was quite ready to sit and talk to somebody because I was in shock and I can't really remember what um, the sight loss counsellor was saying to me. Um, I got I got a lot of written information, which is always really important, isn't it? You know, I'm all about the visuals. Um, but yeah, I, I just can't remember that conversation at all. So I don't know I don't know how useful that was, but at least I knew that there was support there if I needed it. And had this been a relatively sort of inevitable step in the journey or was it quite a surprise, the point at which it came? Um, quite a surprise, yeah. They hadn't really mentioned how bad my corneas were getting at that point. And um, because I was managing quite well with the lenses I had, my appointments were only about six months apart anyway. 
Nice. So what had happened was um, my left one had started to scar. And when your cornea starts to scar, there's a risk of perforation then, which is really painful. Um, so they wanted to intervene at that point be before it got worse. So it was literally within that six month period, everything started to deteriorate. So yeah, it wasn't, wasn't expected. Wow. So that's a lot to kind of come to terms with. And then you wrote in your blog post about um, kind of where you were working and how it was at the time, which suggests that maybe you weren't kind of best placed uh, to be sort of well supported. So you said um, back then I worked in a really tough primary school. I was also the Senko with a third of the pupils on the SEND register. It was a very busy job. The kids needed so much trauma informed care and we were really good at that. What we were absolutely awful at was looking after ourselves and each other. Yeah. Yeah. So you maybe weren't in the best context for kind of, I mean, how, how did, were your colleagues supportive or did you um, ask for support? Yeah. I mean, I had, I had, you know, really close friends there and they were the ones that were just, you know, they just kind of surrounded me. Um, you know, two or three people, that handful of people, but working in a school like that, where, you know, we had so many children with so many history of, of, of trauma various different backgrounds and every single minute of your day was just devoted to that the, you know nobody really had a lunch time in that school nobody really had a break time uh, even morning times were having children turning up with no uniform you know they hadn't eaten so we were busy sorting out sorting out their needs and always putting their needs before ours which I think every educational professional does anyway um, but in terms of staff support and staff well-being that then meant that you know you just you just didn't have it in you almost because it was so tiring and so draining and I suppose at the time we were all suffering from some kind of vicarious trauma without even knowing about it we all took things home with us um, and you know it was one of those schools where you were there at seven and you didn't leave till the caretaker was throwing you out mm. and there was there just wasn't time to talk um, PPA didn't exist then either so we didn't we didn't get that time um, occupational health were, were great in getting me back at the practical side of it and what what I was going to need and you know I couldn't have done that without the RNIB and access to work as well but then once you were back it stopped then so all the preparation was amazing mm -hmm. um, and the follow-up afterwards not so much did you enjoy your work? So before, you know, before you, you ended up kind of going and having the transplants and stuff, were you enjoying that work? Because it sounds heavy. Yeah, yeah, I loved it. It was, it was so varied, um, you know, and it was such a, that was my, that was my NQT school. And I remember that very first year, my very first day, um, a little boy in year three set a little girl's hair on fire with a lighter that he brought from home. And that was my first day. Wow. Um, yeah. And I had another little boy who would um, crawl around the classroom barking like a dog most of the day. It was, it was, you know, just one of those classes. And I kept thinking, why have they put me in here? It's my NQT year. But apparently that was, that was pretty much the best, the best class there was. So it was very much from day one, sink or swim. And it was so wobbly, you know, you just, I just didn't know what I was doing. But I'm so grateful to have started there because I, I probably learned more there than I did in the rest of my career and it gave me the chance to get into other things as well um, and because of the nature of the school we had a speech and language base we had a nature base mm -hmm. and there was lots of opportunities to link up with other settings so it, it was a really good really good job and, and I did enjoy it when I went back as well but it was just so difficult yeah yeah and and and, and that's it you 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 talk about that um, about when you, you went, so I went back, I was determined I could do this. I'd already decided to let go of the Senko role for a while for my own well-being. Um, there's no way I could manage the paperwork. It took me two hours to type one lesson plan. Um, my PA was amazing at being my eyes, but after a good start, things soon got harder. Um, some staff members resented the fact I had an extra adult in class when most of them were sharing one teaching assistant between four classes. There was little awareness of sight loss, so I was just left to get on with it. I mean, yeah. that sounds, I don't even know where to start with that, really. Yeah, I know. And, and, and I think, you know, that PA, the PA that I had through Access to Work, she was to be my eyes. Um, so if I was listening to a child read, I had some magnification equipment that put their book up on a big screen and I could manage to see that. 
um, but I couldn't see the whole class. So she had to kind of sit at the front with me and watch because I couldn't see what Milado was doing at the back. Um, and things like marking, um, I, I couldn't mark children's work. And um, she had to read that to me. So I needed her like, you know, pretty much all of the, ta of the time. Um, but I think a lot of other staff thought, well, it's another adult in the room. That's another adult who can help out, you know, with group work and things like that. And it, and it really wasn't. Um, so I did have her in the class, but I didn't have anyone else to help. So I ended up needing to use her for me, but also needing to use her for other things as well. Um, and it was just, um, the paperwork was just, it was almost unmanageable. When I first went back, um, I'd been to a visual rehabilitation centre for six months. And when I first went back with the agreement of the head teacher, I was released on a Friday to keep going there. Um, and what I used to do on a Friday was try and get the majority of my lesson planning done on that day um, so that it was it was done for the week because I don't think I would have managed to have done it. I was still working till midnight most nights and, you know, doing a full day at the weekend as well. So there was never, never that break. But saying that at the time I was 27 and, you know, you're full of life then and you can do it. I couldn't, I couldn't do it now. No way could I do it now. How much could you see, like, you, you know, what was the, just to give people up, because, you know, obviously you said you, you had the impressions, you, you couldn't see much, but like, what, how much are we talking? Just really outline shapes and, and colours. Um, prior to me going back, not really much at all. It was just fuzzy, fuzzy shapes. And I know I gave you a link to, um, a site simulator and you know people can use that and have a, have a little look at what my site was like that gives you more of an idea and um, but yeah just just really fuzzy colors outlines of things so I could make out somebody's head but I couldn't see their facial features um, and then as time went on a little bit by the time I went back I was six months post-surgery mm -hmm. um, and I could manage I could manage text at quite a large print level you know which was something else that was difficult because it was a requirement that I got a certain size text on a certain colour and I could see it then. It made life so much easier. But for people to actually, I don't think they intentionally didn't give me it, but people had to remember to give me, you know, that size font. And we'd be in meetings and these huge packs would be handed out and mine was, you know, standard size font. So I, I couldn't, I literally couldn't see a thing. Um, so, you know, feeling, feeling quite lost a lot of the time. And, and not just in a work sense, but in a, in a life sense because so much changes in your actual life as well it, it sounds like some of those things that you needed you know having your you know notes in a larger size font these don't sound like the hardest of adjustments to make for someone do you know what I mean like as a Senko um, you're used to making adjustments for, for pupils who need support for whatever reason and I'm I'm a little bit intrigued as to just why would I mean why were why were reasonable adjustments not just automatically all the time made? You know, is that is that is that common or? I don't think so now. Um, but then we're talking fifteen years ago, and the Disability Discrimination Act had only just come into force. Okay. It had only been in effect for about a year. Um, so so no, people people just didn't. And I also think time as well, because you know, if you've got to copy a 50 page document in size 24 font on yellow paper, you've got to first of all, look for the yellow paper. Mm -hmm. um, a lot of schools have a real strict military policy on photocopying, don't they? Um, and it would take, I don't know, it would be maybe six times the amount of paper um, and take twice the amount of time to, to get it enlarged. Um, so I think then, you know, awareness wasn't, wasn't like that, but I know, I know now it's definitely a lot better. And once the Disability Discrimination Act was in place, people could, people could use that. I mean, you shouldn't have to use that, but you did. You would have to start saying, I am covered under the Disability and Discrimination Act. And then people go, oh, and it's the same now. Um, my partner's blind and we have a guide dog and you know, over the years, I've seen I've seen such a shift in that fifteen years to how we were with the dog with the dog originally, and how it is now. Um, you know, I know I, st I still ring up restaurants and say we're going to be coming with a guide dog, but I know it's always going to be okay, and people will sit us in a corner and they'll take a chair away. 
um, and they'll bring a bowl of water for the dog. But 15 years ago, you were lucky if you could get in a restaurant. Wow. Um, you know, but there was one, there was one time we were literally physically chased out with the dog. Um, so, so I think we've come a long way in a, in a short time. And talk to me about how you met your partner, because you wrote about this in your, your blog as well, but you actually met during the course of your recovery, right? That's right, yeah. So in Liverpool, we have um, a visual rehabilitation centre. So when you first lose your sight, social services become involved. And I was sent, I was sent there. And it, and it was fate, really, because he, he went on a Friday and I should have been going on a Tuesday, but I switched the day. Um, and the purpose of that place was it was to teach you how to touch type how to use software that would speak to you, um, how to use a white cane, how to cook safely in the kitchen, lots of life skills, and um, how to get dressed in the morning, you know, when you can't see what you're putting on, and um, how to put your makeup on, things like that. And we would have a social area as well. So I ended up in, in a couple of cookery sessions with him and then in the social area too. And, and it, was, it was strange really because most of the people there, um, were probably over 60 mm -hmm. <laughs> and there was nobody my age and Danny was probably the closest mm -hmm. um, so we kind of just buddied up really and he'd gone through um, a really bad time he was really unlucky and losing his sight and it just kind of started where he was almost like a mentor to me because um, I don't know just such a such a calming influence such you know one of those people that um, we'll just sit and listen. And I think that's sometimes all we need. We don't need fixing. We don't need anyone to solve the problem for us. We just need somebody who's going to sit and listen and can empathise. You know, it's all, it's all those counselling skills, isn't it? Yeah. Um, and he was, he was really, really, really good at that. And because he'd been through it, he boosted me up um, in a way that nobody else really could. Um, because he understood from the inside or... Yeah, 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 he knew what it was like. Um, and I think, I think, hand on heart, if I asked him, he'd probably say it made him feel better, being able to help somebody himself, because um, he was going through a really, really rough time. Um, so I think, I think that as well. And yeah, we just, we just, we just bonded. And, you know, that was, that was the good thing to come out of it. <laughs> and, Everything should have a silver lining, but that seems like a pretty massive one, I have to say. <laughs> and it was such a it was such a big thing, and you know, we actually didn't get together till after we'd left. We were we were just the best of friends, and then um, I think I think I'd I'd left to go back to work at that point, and, and you know, he he asked me out then, and then it went from there. But we we had our baby then together. He's nine now. Oh. Um, so that was a big story and they had us up they had us back with the baby when he was first born and we had to take take photos in front of the door and they were like oh it's the first Christopher Grange baby <laughs> oh that's so lovely and was your husband um further ahead in that kind of journey than you had he lost his sight longer ago or yeah 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 um he was really unlucky he he um he got he had a detached retina from a fall um but he'd been a boxer in his early days so probably a weakness there and they couldn't do anything to fix that and he lost that eye wow. and then he was extremely unlucky in the fact that he got something called sympathetic ophthalmia which is an immune system disorder so what happens is your immune system starts to attack your good eye it's oh. very rare i mean at the time there were two people in the country wow had that so whenever he sees a consultant now that and they hear his story they're just like oh he was so unlucky um and interestingly it's what happened to louis braille louis braille lost an eye um puncturing it with one of his dad's tools but then got sympathetic up palmer in the in the in the good eye um so that's what has happened to danny but you know the only thing that brought him out of it, he told me that the because he had his dark moments, and you know, you talked about genuinely feeling suicidal, and and he had those times as well. And the only thing that brought him out of that was getting the guide dog. Um, oh, really? Yeah, he said it was the only thing that worked. So he would literally just sit in a room all day, wouldn't go anywhere, wouldn't speak to anyone. He was, he said, he was awful, you know, to live with. He he was just really angry and. Um, really really nasty and once he got the dog he just felt like he had that semblance of his life again and some kind of normality because once he got that dog he got his independence back 
people who are out without having to rely on somebody else and that is the one of the hardest things is is your loss of your independence when you lose your sight because you're totally totally reliant on somebody else you can't go out the house without having somebody with you and you know can't you can't go to a shop and choose clothes without having somebody with you and sometimes you need space but you can't have it (laughs) at the same time so 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 the dog um is is transformational and you just can't put into words what what a guide dog um, can mean to somebody and, and giving their life back so so the dog gave him his life back and my donor cornea has gave me my life back um and i think at the time as well as this you know i said about your life changing and not be, not being independent you totally lose your identity totally you just don't even know who you are you don't you don't fit why um, because the friendship group that you're in, you know, late 20s, 26, 27, all my friends are going out all the time. And that's how we socialise. We go out for meals, we have nights out. And one of, the, one, of the, one of the strange things that people won't think about is that a lot of people, when they lose their sight, they will not eat in public anymore at all because you can't see what you're doing. You can't see where the food is. Mm. Um, you lift a fork to your mouth, it'll drop off more times than, than you know you care to imagine you don't realize how much you use your sight to eat mm. um, so you don't want to go out for a meal anymore and um, if you're going out to a pub at the age of 27 and your friends have all had a drink and you're just stood on your own it's absolutely terrifying you don't know where you know you can't see anybody mm. so so your social life goes it, it's very difficult to go out um, and if you do go out then you feel you feel guilty because you feel like you've got to have somebody babysitting you all the time because you can't be left on your own. You can't even go to the toilet on your own, you know. Mm-hmm. So, so it's quite it's quite degrading. Um, you you just feel like you don't fit. There's this reliance on other people that you might not particularly want to accept. Um, and you know, no matter how how good people are to you, and they were that you know, my family, and my friends were just amazing, and I'd never got through it without them. But it's just how it changes how it changes for you um, and socialising is so difficult anyway and you know I think about this when when I go and visit schools and I go and um, talk to um, my autistic pupils or I'm doing training on autism I always think of my sight loss because there's so many experiences at that time that help me relate to how autism may possibly feel so you know the fact that I can't see faces you know, when I lose my sight, I cannot read facial expressions when I can't see. Um, I don't know when people are talking to me when I couldn't, you know, when I couldn't see because people would start to talk and because I couldn't make eye contact and I didn't know if they were looking in my direction and I couldn't read their face, I, I wouldn't know. And, and until they said my name, they would say Kate and then I'd be like, oh, Hugh in, you know, mm-hmm. and that's exactly what I talk about with my autistic pupils you know they can't read faces a lot of them and you know um, don't know when don't include themselves in in in, in instructions and things like that so the similarities and um, the other thing that was a massive um, thing to me that that we all needed actually Danny as well you you suddenly need um, a very structured routine and lots of predictability and again i know what that feels like not to have that so again for my pupils yeah. please put the routine and that predictability in you need a routine f- for everything when you can't see you have to lay your clothes out the night before because mm. it takes so much longer to do things like cleaning the kitchen worktop you have to do it in a set pattern they teach you to go up left down left up oh left, really down. Yeah, so you talk these certain procedures and ways of doing things. Um, because you can't see, you also can't remember. So you're really reliant on these these like predictable routines yeah. and structures. And then if you are going to go out somewhere, you need to know where are you going? You know, how are you going to get there? What's it like when you get there? Where am I going to be sat? Who's going to be with me? All of those types of things are really important. Um so so yeah i feel like it's really helped me do my job so much better it's a totally different thing but it's just that i can i, I get it I can, I can get some of it um 
And the other thing, the other thing as well is, and I now know what a sensory um, difference is in terms of perception because when I couldn't see, um, the supermarket was the absolute worst place for me to be. Um, okay. I had a real problem with depth perception. So if I reached for an object on a shelf, I'd, I'd be grabbing, thinking it was closer to me than it actually was. Um, and the other horrific thing was walking down a supermarket aisle and having people coming towards me. So because I had this problem with the depth, it literally looked like people were swarming at me. I couldn't oh, wow. tell where exactly they were. Um, so it was, re it, was, it was real fear. I, I used to just freeze with my and grip my trolley so tight until they'd gone past me. Wow. It's almost like the only thing I can describe it as is, you know, when you go and watch a 3D film and you've got mm -hmm. those people with you, it, it's that kind of feeling. Wow. So, you know, when my pupils talk about not being able to go in a corridor at a transition time because of the busyness of that corridor and the, and the stairs, not being able to manage the stairs, I kind of get how disorientating and how it, it, it is literally frightening, really, really frightening. Do you think that that experience and being able to sort of empathise with that, has that shaped kind of, because you were already working as a Senko, weren't you? But has it kind of shaped what you do as well as how you do it or? Yeah, definitely. And it's made me do this now as my job, you know, because I was teaching for, teaching in Senko for 15 years and I've been doing, um, the autism outreach and consultancy and training now for oh six years now and um, uh, I think when I got to 15 years of teaching I thought oh it's like 15 years since you know my sight as well and, and it almost instigated that change what do I want to do next and yeah. I always wanted to go into this particular line of work and you know I've always loved working with um autistic children and their parents absolutely loved it so so I got into this yeah and and it definitely does you know I think you know we all try and empathize don't we but there's there's some situations that you can empathize more with and I think it just makes you put this like really determined hat on you know and it makes you fight for these kids you know I'm going to make sure these kids are okay and, you know it makes you more passionate about what you do um and, and you're able to connect then I think and, and that connection is so important and I think going through being disabled you don't see yourself ever as disabled I, I still don't see Danny as blind now mm -hmm. um, he's just Danny he's yeah. just a person um, and I think when I when I therefore meet a pupil for the first time I don't look at what's on that piece of paper I don't look at what their diagnoses are or what condition they have. I mean, I know, I know what it is, and I've got my my background knowledge of that. But sometimes I meet somebody, and what what my perception might be, because I know they've got a diagnosis of autism or whatever, it totally throws me because it, it's not what I thought at all. Um, so I always start with the person, and I think losing my sight has really helped me with that. I never see, I don't ever see somebody as disabled. I don't see ever see somebody as having a certain condition. I just I just start with the person. Is that because of how you felt when you weren't seeing them? Was that to do with your kind of perception of self or was it to do with how other people kind of treated and responded to you? I think how other people treated mm. and responded to me, yeah. I couldn't stand the fact that when I was in visual rehab, I knew the staff would have meetings about me. I couldn't stand that. Without you? Well, they would have meetings with me. But they'd also have their team meetings, you know, like you would mm. in a school. You'd have your Monday meeting once a week. Um, and I didn't like the fact that I know, I know they were only planning what, what they were going to do next and things like that. And it would always be discussed with me and, and it was always involving me. But I just didn't like the thought that, that they were talking about me, you know, without me being there. And another thing um, that really affect, affected me and, and still affects Danny now in our life is... I couldn't bear um, the sympathy. I couldn't bear people looking at me like, oh, that poor girl. And I remember I wouldn't use a white cane. I was literally bullied into using a white cane because the minute I held a white cane, everybody would know I couldn't see. And I almost wanted to hide that. I, I would have much rather have been out in public with another person standing next to me 
um, link in their arm. I didn't want that cane at all. Um, you know, I was offered a guide dog as well, which I didn't want to take because I knew it was only going to be temporary and I didn't want to take a dog off somebody who was going to, you know, be blind for life. So I wouldn't have a dog. Um, and I remember crossing the road one day, I was doing training with the white cane and we crossed over and there was a couple of ladies at a bus stop mm. and I could see them look towards me. And people forget, you know, when you can't see, you can still hear. <laughs> <laughs> they, they were they were talking to each other and they and they said to each other oh that poor girl oh look at her so young that poor poor girl and that just that was just not nice to hear at all I didn't want anyone to think poor girl and, and you know poor me I didn't I didn't want that because I was trying to get through it and I was trying to survive so when somebody's saying you poor thing that that's not conducive <laughs> um to trying to get through things and um, Danny will say the same now, you know, he, he doesn't want, he doesn't want sympathy, you know, he, he, he's happy, he has a good life, um, and, you know, you, you, you just don't, you just don't want anyone to think poor you. <laughs> is there any place for that? I mean, you went through a really tough time, is, you know, was there anyone in your life that you would have accepted or wanted kind of sympathy and empathy from, or was it really just about focusing on continuing and getting through it? I think I think part of that is a shield, isn't it? Because the minute you start to accept sympathy is when you start to crumble, mm. I think. Um, and I felt like I was made of glass at that time. And I had those times on my own in private where something would happen and I would literally break. I would just break into a thousand pieces Um Oh, I'm getting upset talking about it now, but just little, just little things. It didn't even have to be anything big. It could be something like, I remember one night I came home from work um, and I had a doctor's appointment and I got home from work and just to get to the doctors, I had to get two buses there and two buses back. So by the time I got home, it was half past seven um, and it started pouring with rain and I got in the door and I just, I just collapsed inside the door and I just sat on the floor and I just cried. Mm -hmm. um, and it was it was only that you know it started to rain and and the bus the buses took so long but that's what it was like it was just these little things would just shatter me into a million pieces and then I'd have to pull myself together and 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 I think you know we talk about resilience don't we and the things that we have in our lives to make us resilient and I just think you know life's going to break everybody at some point um and it's just where you get where you get the strength from at those times to put all those broken pieces back together and and I think you know we don't have to be strong all the time no um, no and I, and I think actually you know hearing you kind of say how that felt at that time and it, and actually it seems like a perfectly reasonable response um in just the same way that I've got lots of people coming to me at the moment needing so support and advice with their mental health because we're in the middle of a pandemic and you know what people are feeling low and they're feeling anxious and that's a really reasonable response in the given situation and I think that to lose your sight like that and so young and for it to feel like it it took away so much of who you were and what you wanted to do the mm -hmm. fact that maybe you you'd feel a bit down about that and find it a little bit hard to manage day to day sometimes that that seems normal no reasonable yeah. was that something they prepared you you know you went to this site rehabilitation center um and as well as introducing you to the love of your life uh, they taught you how to do many things to to manage day to day how to wipe surfaces in the right way so you didn't miss a bit did they talk to you about your mental health and your emotional well-being as well yeah yeah we had um we had like weekly mentoring sessions so so we'd always have an hour with somebody um who worked there and then there was um counseling on offer as well which i did do a little a little bit of but mm -hmm. i don't know i just the counseling helped a little bit but i couldn't I, I felt like i needed somebody who understood who had gone through it so you know obviously my counselor was cited and the majority of the staff were cited as well mm -hmm. so my comfort and my rehabilitation and my counseling came from the other clients that went to the rehabilitation center because I just felt like, well, they all know what it feels, they all know what it feels like. So when they give me advice, 
that's genuine advice you know that's coming from there <laughs> yeah. that's coming from somebody that knows what what this is like and and you know when you were saying about you know losing this identity I used to I used to oh look forward to those Fridays so much because it was the only place where I felt comfortable in my whole entire week wow. because when I went there everybody was in the same boat I wasn't the different one um, and we were all in the same boat and it was like the sight loss didn't exist it didn't matter it's almost like it took it away for a day so I used to just wait for those Fridays wow and were you unusual there in that I, I guess from the beginning you knew that this was going to be a temporary thing for you um were there other people in the same situation or were most of them losing their no. sight for good no there was nobody else who was gonna um get their sight back there at that time so there was about 15 of us there on a friday and I must say that in itself came with an incredible amount of guilt. I used to feel mm. so guilty that, you know, I, w I was there and I was going to be okay and they weren't. So when some things were offered to me, like the guide dog, which would have helped me, I wouldn't, I just felt like I wasn't entitled um, because they were in a much worse position than I was. But does that make sense? I mean, would you, you know, if you were working with a child and maybe they're autistic, but they're not, you know, they are higher functioning, say, than the next kid, would that mean that they shouldn't take the support that's offered to them? I mean, in your role working with them, would you advise that? It shouldn't mean that they take the support, but I think you and I know a lot of children don't want that support and don't want to be different, and don't want to stand out. Um, but... I always find a way to get that support in, in a discreet way. Um, so I have a few children I'm working with at the moment who will not accept anything that looks different to anybody else, particularly the teenagers. Yeah, so when we're trying to put these visuals in uh, that we know are going to help yeah. and they won't accept them. As far as I'm concerned, that is absolutely fine. I wouldn't, I wouldn't carry on with that because I know how it feels to have something forced upon me like using a white cane mm. I really did not want to do that to the point of where I was defiant about that so if I if if I know that something's going to work for people I'll try it but if they don't want it then that has to be their decision but then it's about how we find ways to put that indiscreetly mm. so uh, you know an example would be I've had a, a young man who I worked with he was 15 and we did a lot of work on anxiety and emotional regulation and he needed to indicate when he needed to leave that room, but he just wouldn't accept anything that was different. So we put two biros in his pencil case. And if he pull, pulled the green one out that everybody used anyway for correcting the work, if he took the green one out and it was on his desk, that meant he needed to leave the room. So it was just finding other ways of, do, of, of doing that. And then, yeah, yeah, being discreet about it. <laughs> Would you, if you could go back and, you know, mentor yourself almost, would you sort of counsel that maybe take the dog, maybe use the stick, maybe take the help, you deserve it? Or, or do you think that the approach that you took is the one you would advocate? Yeah, I, I don't think I'd change anything. I just I think I just have to go with what felt. I, I'm, I'm a heart person <laughs> <laughs> and I do, I do go with my heart and I go with my gut a lot and maybe you know, I'm wrong and maybe I'll think about that later. And sometimes, yeah, that was the wrong thing to do. But in that situation, I genuinely still think that I got that, got through that in the best way that I could. Um, and I think because, because you're so anxious all the time, you don't have that capacity to think things through properly. Um, so I think of a lot of, a lot of what you do, especially when you're on the spot and you're out and about, yeah. and you can't see, you just go with your gut. Um, and, and thinking doesn't really really come into it yeah. if that makes sense <laughs> it makes perfect sense you're just kind of trying to manage to get through minute to minute by the sound of it really yeah. and, and it does sound a bit doom and gloom but you know there were so many funny things as well I was going to ask was there any darkly humorous moments um, yeah. um so I remember um I went to Asda um and you know when I was saying about that depth perception I ended up knocking a whole pyramid of chocolate oranges oh, no. on the floor. <laughs> and the security guard was amazing um, 
I remember standing there going, I'm so sorry, I can't see. I'm so sorry, I can't see. <laughs> I just ran over. He was like, it's all right, love. I'll fix it. I'll build it back up again. And he <laughs> handed me a chocolate orange and he said, take that home with you. It's all right. <laughs> oh, know? bless him. Um, and the, the, the other thing I did one time was um, you used to have a device and you put it on your uh, clothes and it speaks to you and tells you what colour. Oh, okay. So you know what kind of clothes you wear and you see. But it didn't work for me one day. And I went to school and one of the kids said to me, Miss, why have you got a brown shoe on and a black shoe on? <laughs> <laughs> and I'd gone to school with two. They were both the same shoe. I just had them in two different colours. And I hadn't, I hadn't actually realised. I told them, do you know what? And I was so quick. I just said, it. Oh, it, it, oh, I forgot to tell you. It's our shoe day. It's our shoe day. <laughs> <laughs> oh, that's then, hilarious. The other thing that my mum said to me was, um, when I when when my left eye was was recovered enough to, and it was settled enough, because what happens is you have to wait six months, and then over a period of another six months, they start to take stitches out, um, wow. but they take alternates. They might take top and bottom, left and right. There's sixteen stitches in there, so you have to keep going back every two months to get just two more out, two more out. So there's a lot of adjustments and a lot of time to wait. But when I did first get my glasses, um, you know, my surgeons were, were, were incredible. And if I go to see an optometrist now, they still say to me, these are the best transplant grafts I've ever seen. So I'm really lucky. But when I first got that pair of glasses, I ended up with 20-20 vision in my left eye, which was wow. just, oh, I can't even describe it. It was just incredible. And um I remember putting these glasses on and I came home. It was a bit wobbly, you know, because they were all new. And I saw my family for the first time and I just went, oh, God, you all look so much older. <laughs> <laughs> and my mum was like, what? And I went, I didn't know you had wrinkles at the side of your eyes. <laughs> and it just, That's hilarious. I can't, I can't believe I said that. It just came up because I'd not been able to see faces for so long. Um, and I saw all these features, you know, lines and all. How about yourself? Did you look different? Yeah, 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 definitely. Definitely, yeah. Um, but it was nice to be able to see, see things again. You know, it was nice to be able to go to the hairdressers and to get my hair cut and to see what that looked like and to be able to put makeup on and to be able to go and choose clothes again um, and just, oh, to, to read. You know, I really miss reading. I tried the Audible books, but every time I did, I fell asleep. Mm -hmm. And then eventually to be able to drive. Um, and, you know, most blind people who've driven will say it's the thing that they they miss the most yeah, it's your independence isn't it out of anything yeah and, and it's time as well because when you can drive everything's so much quicker, mm -hmm. isn't it mm -hmm. um so yeah being able being able to drive was just amazing um and and, and somebody asked me the other day actually on, on twitter when they'd read the blog is there anything you miss about not being able to sit mm. so i had to have a think about that one as well and i do miss um you know that that group that group of people who I was with, you know, you know, that, that sense of community yeah. and that sense of spirit and determination and, and being with, you know, that, that particular group. And the other thing I miss, um, it sounds, sounds so strange, but when I couldn't see, I used to get these beautiful, um, things happening with light. So one of them was halos. So mm -hmm. I would see literally at, at night time, everything would have a halo around it, oh, street wow. lights, car lights. It was so, so pretty. Um, and then I used to get these starbursts as well. So that used to happen at dusk rather than rather than dark. And at dusk, just when, when light started to come on, um, a starburst is where you see, you'll see that the centre, but literally like a star, you see all the lines. You oh, know, wow. it looks like it looks like fireworks and I suppose I miss the halos and the, and the starbursts. Was getting your sight back anything like, I, I'm assuming that you've read The Rules of Seeing, maybe you haven't, Joe Heap's book, have you, have you read that? No, I haven't, no. Oh, oh you're going to have to read it then, and then we'll have to talk again. So Joe Heap um, wrote a book called The Rules of Seeing, which is fiction, um, but it's about a girl who um, has been blind, I think all of her life, and then she gains her vision in her, I, I want to say her 20s. She's, you know, she's, she's not a child. She's a, she's a fully grown adult, but she's never seen before. And um, 
she she thinks that she really really wants to be able to see but she actually goes through this it's really i mean it's an amazing book but she goes through a very deep process of like reconnecting and and she finds the world really visually overwhelming and i think it was very interesting in that it made you think really carefully about stuff like she had to work for months to learn to catch a ball and things because if you've never developed vision you haven't got depth perception a bit like you said i guess and yeah i don't know i found it very fascinating but i think yeah i think it questioned that assumption that you know if you're blind that you should want to be able to see and that would make everything better and yeah and i think talking to people as well that there's a huge difference between being born without sight and then losing your sight later on because i think you know if you're born with it You've, you've never experienced it so you don't miss it and, and if you've had it and then it goes then of course you're going to miss it aren't you yeah and were you in a different situation because you kind of knew this was a, something that might happen at some point so were you able to kind of pre prepare for it in any way were there things you learned to do whilst you were sighted in preparation for losing your sight or no do you know what nothing at all and that that sounds strange doesn't it because you think if, if you knew something mm. that you know, if, you, if you know you're going to be ill you'll prepare with but um and the only thing i can i can think to explain that is because one you're putting your blinkers on because you don't want to think that's going to happen you don't want to think about it but also it, it's unimaginable until it happens you cannot imagine what it's going to be like um so you don't exactly know what to do what's going to help how to prepare um i think i think if um the visual rehabilitation people have become involved before the sight loss as well as after mm. that would have been helpful for mm. sure and um, learning how to do things it wouldn't have taken definitely touch type i would have done that you know all the way because that took me so long um to learn how to do that and that's something you, you can do anyway so so I, I would say the touch typing would have been the biggest prep for me in terms of work and was there anything about uh you know when when you kind of regained your sight again obviously you talked about a, a couple of the, the the prettiness that you missed and, and maybe that group but you you know people treated you in a certain way when you lost your sight and was there anything there about your kind of self-identity because you kind of lost yourself you said when you lost your vision but was there a sense of that again almost when you gained it back because it must have been a really big part of your life mm, yeah it was a huge part um hmm, that's a good question Pukki. Um, I try. <laughs> <laughs> I think I was not so much an identity, but I think I was very tentative. Um, I didn't rush back to doing things. It took me a long time to socialise again. Um, mm -hmm. And I think that came from just how fearful I'd been in those situations. So for a very, very long time, putting myself back into a social situation when I was away from home and I was on an, in an unfamiliar place was still really difficult, even though I could see. And I don't know whether that was just triggering, um, you know, that fear that I'd felt back then. I don't know. I'm not too sure. Um, but I was genuinely fearful about going out to the point where I'd sometimes cancel or I'd avoid. And I am a really sociable person. <laughs> Um, I love being with people. I just, I just love people. I love watching them, but I just couldn't, couldn't do that. Um, and then, I think in terms of um, family and friends, nothing really changed there um, at all. But yeah, and, and I think oh, it's just, I think I became a little less tolerant at times as well. I think that changed once I got my sight back. In what um, sense? I just, I just found it difficult um, to tolerate when, and, I, and this is going to sound awful, but you know when people were just really down and <laughs> really, um, you know, moaning about little things, basically. And I know I should be a good friend and I should listen to all that and I know that and I do that now, of course I do, but at the time, um, I just thought, oh, there's, there's just so many people that are so much, you know, more worse off. Um, and I found that I wasn't able to be very sympathetic, empathetic at that time. Because um, I wanted, I think because I was happy and everything was okay again, I wanted everyone else to be happy. 
um, and everything, everything to be okay. And, and part of that was probably, I wasn't strong enough quite in myself to deal with other people's problems as well. Yeah, so it was a bit protective. Yeah. So it came from a place of, I'm happy now, everyone should be happy, rather than, what are you moaning about? I've just spent the last X years being blind. <laughs> yeah, and I didn't, I didn't want to ever use that. But it, it, And I never ever said it either. I didn't say it out loud. And I would never use the fact that that had happened to me. Because no matter what anybody's problem is, it's a problem to them, isn't it? No matter how small it is, it, it, still, it still affects them. Um, but just at that time, I just, I just couldn't quite put myself there. But now I've gone the total opposite way. <laughs> I'm almost too empathetic now. <laughs> so I feel it, you know, I feel it, um, what, what, what people are, are like. And, you know, I think in some ways it, it's made me go out of my way to make, um, to try and be as empathetic as possible and to try and understand people and, and to just try and be nice. Um, be nice to people and to thank people and to be kind you know it goes such a long way you know when somebody just shows a little bit of kindness doesn't it and how how so how did losing your sight make you you know kind of influence that in you I don't know I just did know. that's a difficult one yeah did you keep in touch with the people who were in your Friday group? I mean, obviously one of them, but. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, to keep him. He kept the dog, you see, that was it. I didn't keep the dog up at that point, could I? <laughs> it was all about the dog, really. No, um, yeah, I kept in touch with um, a couple of people. Um, there's a lady that we know now, she's fabulous. Uh, such an advocate for people with sight loss. Um, and we are big Liverpool supporters. And the advantage of having a blind partner is that he gets two season tickets uh, for the price of one. So he gets to take somebody with him all the time, i.e. me. Um, and, and this particular lady goes to the match as well. So I always go and see her um, every time I go. There are, there, are, there are the odd perks on there. When I was um, using a wheelchair, then I could go and see shows in the West End really cheaply and get amazing seats and take my husband with me. Yeah. Um, so, you know, yeah. you, take, you take the little perks. Uh, <laughs> so, you... perk, so many free... <laughs> Danny always says to me, you're only with me to use me, aren't you? That's it. I just get you the free festival ticket and the free concert ticket. <laughs> <laughs> so, I, I'm interested to know, like, when you and Danny were first together and you were newer to kind of not having your sight and kind of working your way through that time, do you think it was more helpful that you were together and you were muddling your way through, or was it just like double jeopardy? <laughs> no, it was definitely more helpful because um, it it was quite it was quite cute really because we couldn't we couldn't see each other as often as as we would have liked to because transport was so difficult. You couldn't just jump in a car and no. you know go somewhere, and we couldn't we couldn't go to places that we wanted to go. So we always had to check: is the dog okay there? Can we get there? Um, what's it like you know what how how is it in terms of light you have to think about lighting as well you don't go to dark places <laughs> um so we used to do things like plan where we were going to meet and sometimes we were much better being outdoors somewhere because yeah. we didn't have to deal with buildings and navigating stairs and you know walkways and, and steps all that kind of thing so we'd often go to the park and we used to just get a bus and he got a bus, I got a bus. We knew a certain place where we could meet and then we'd go and get a picnic and go to the park. So we did a lot of things like that. But that was great because it was almost like having that, that crutch to lean on. Um, I, I, I hated going anywhere on my own. So if we were together, yeah. if we ended up, you know, in a bad situation, at least we were in it together. <laughs> <laughs> I guess that, that's there's always something isn't there and I tell people this all the time in my in my work I've never thought about it in the sense of, of sight loss I have to say but there's something about you can't necessarily fix a situation for someone but if you can make them feel less alone in their in their pain in their worry in their experience then I think that goes quite a long way actually doesn't it yeah and I think you know telling stories like this as hard as they may be um you're not a victim when you share you know a bad story you're actually you're a survivor and that's how I see it you know sharing your story makes you a survivor and you never know who's listening no who may need to hear that story to just get a little bit of courage themselves it's so true I have to ask this is a really sort of shallow and superficial question but 
you met Danny when you couldn't see. Did you kind of have like, you know, did you have in your mind what he was going to look like? And did he, <laughs> how was it when you saw him? <laughs> um, I could see, cause I could see the outline and you kind of the shape, but I didn't quite know the face. Um, and I asked him the same cause he, he couldn't, he has very little sight. And I mm. said to him, um, could you see me at all? And he said, no, no. I said, so what was it? And he went, I knew from day one with you. And I, and I and I said to him, how did you know from day one? And he said it was just the energy and the voice and the bubbliness. Mm. And I think that that's a really nice thing about us because when people meet and start a relationship, no matter how much we say it doesn't matter, looks do matter, don't they? You know, people people look at each other. Um, and the fact that I always felt great and it always made me feel great that somebody wanted to be with me because of my personality and they didn't know what I looked like at all. And the same, you know, the same the other way around. I couldn't see him, but it was it was him as a person, um, you know, that, that I fell in love with, not not him and what he looked like. So strong foundations there <laughs> from the from the off. Yeah. And that, and that and I think that yeah it must bring a real depth. Yeah, a real depth. Mm. But what was it like when you felt like you know when you when you then could see him was that strange or no no not really because I just I just felt like I knew him already I knew him so well and it didn't really it didn't even come into it then wow at all no not at all and there was no revelation you know where I suddenly saw his face and thought whoo um it was just <laughs> you know I could see and that was that and I didn't it didn't even cross my mind what he looked like um, really well it was six months on you know yeah um, yeah I'd already left I'd left the visual rehabilitation center um I hadn't got my glasses at that point so probably we were probably in a relationship for three or four months before I actually got glasses and could see him properly so yeah it, it's just it didn't even cross my mind at all mm. just like how it doesn't cross my mind now that he can't see and yeah. there's only certain situations, you know, when it comes up because the, the dog's everything, you know, the dog, it, it makes him so independent. And when I went, when I had Sam, um, our, our son, I had to go back to work straight away. Um, you know, he was only five months old. So, you know, Danny was looking after the baby. And as long as he's got the dog, they went everywhere. Sam got strapped on the backpack mm. and off he went. Um, once, once the dog knows a route, we're really lucky. We're he's on, we're on the second guide dog now, and we've been really lucky with the dogs we've had. Um, most of the time, they only need to learn a route once. Wow! And they know it. Um, so I wish I was like that. <laughs> <laughs> to do with that in my life. Oh gosh, I'm terrible. Like uh, yeah, I, I take many many times to learn a route. So yeah, maybe the the, the dog is a. <laughs> I'm exactly the same, you know, I can't remember. I'm so bad with directions. <laughs> so I get lost. I would get lost in a square room. And um and then when we've been to hotels, I'm terrible at remembering where the room is. And you know, when I couldn't see, I couldn't see mm. the doors on the on the rooms. So finding the door and the dog would literally just walk down the corridor and he would just stop outside the door and it was always the right one. <laughs> oh, that's amazing. And they, they're also great if you lose your car in the car park as well. Oh, don't. I, th this is a, an actual like proper problem for me. Um, I, I do like really lose my car. Um, and I, I have a, a blue badge actually to help because I struggle so much with my anxiety and stuff to do with autism. Um, and I'm not always able to keep myself safe. But the main thing that it gives me is the ability to always find my way back. Because when I if I've spent all day kind of doing kind of out there stuff being with people it takes every single bit of me and I literally have lost all capacity to problem solve and I have before now it sounds so ridiculous I have before now spent like over half an hour looking for my car in the wrong car park it's yeah um, anyhow um so um as we kind of draw to draw to a place thank you so much for your honesty and your openness and for exploring this and i think as you said it, it might be what somebody somewhere needs to hear um right now if that somebody is is listening who finds themselves in an even vaguely similar situation what would you want them to know that they're going to get through it that they're just going to find a new way um, they're going to find a new way of life, that they're going to find a way to adapt, but it's not always going to feel that bad. Um, 
and to know that there are people around you who are going to pull you through it so when you have those days when you just feel like you are never going to get through this and that's the end of that there's always going to be somebody who, who you can talk to who, who will drag you through it if needs be.